Hi there, guys. This is John Evans. I'm here with uh, Matt Lewis. Hey. hey. Bro. How's it going? Awesome. We're, uh, we're here in quarantine of 2020, uh, finding new means of keeping book and spade afloat. Uh, we've been actually trying to figure out ways of getting more video content to the page to all of you. And uh, we've been looking up some new material, which has been, you know, just keeping us busy and fascinated and digging into our biblical origins. So Matt, you found a really interesting piece on the Epic of Gilgamesh from NPR about this 3,000 year old tablet. What did you dig up? Yeah, there was this, there's a 3.5 thousand year old tablet, which um, Homeland Security investigations basically are, are looking into. Um, just a civilian complaint um, was at the Washington DC Museum of the Bible, you know, in the window, this cuneiform tablet, um, and they described it as stolen Iraqi property. So now Homeland Security investigations are, you know, looking into it to see if it should be returned to Iraq, where its true home, you know, is, and no, nothing more than that, other than, you know, describing the value of the tablet, how old it is. And, but the thing that's interesting is the, is the fact that it is a, you know, um, tablet of the story of Gilgamesh, which had me thinking of some old memories that we've had together, talking about that myth and other flood myths um, in general. I thought this would be fun to talk about. Yeah, no, it definitely is a loop back to the biblical account in Genesis, you know, seven through nine, which we hold to be the you know the true holy and inerrant account. But you also have this cultural memory from all the peoples of the world of this worldwide deluge. My question was, when you're reading it, Matt, were you thinking like Graham Hancock, Finger of Prince of the Gods? Like, what was coming to mind as you were reading it? Well, yeah, that was, that's definitely what I was thinking about. I was thinking about, you know, the, the concept that one of the earliest ever, well, the earliest recorded story that we, from our own archaeological resources, have been able to recover is a story about a man seeking immortality. Somehow, I guess, in the fact that this story is written down, even though it's a myth, it, it, he has achieved it. You know, Gilgamesh has achieved that level of immortality. And, uh, but the fact that it includes a, a flood myth is something that's really phenomenal and interesting in a lot of ways because it basically is pointing to um the fact that there is there was once an ancient um advanced civilization that was potentially wiped out and that um our current lineage of our current history and you know historical narrative um it goes so far back and even as far back as it goes it points to the fact that there is this unknown to a certain degree wiped out history uh, a, a whole other narrative, a whole other timeline. Um, and so, yeah, that's where my head always goes with these kinds of things. You know, I love trying to connect the dots. Yeah, it, it really is cool being able to discuss with you again, even just via live stream. It reminds me of the days when we talked about this stuff, hanging to like the Elm Street El Dorado Diner and just kind of over a couple of you know, iced coffees, trying to explore what is the foundation of our world? And ultimately, you have God's word and you have man's word. You have the narrative presented in the Holy Bible in Genesis 1 through 11. And then you have essentially, you know, the culture's, um, you know, either political or ideologically tainted approach. And yet, you have wonderful corroboration, as you said, from history, the idea of a man seeking immortality. Um, once again, this seems to be a kind of fallen or corrupt idea of the the lie of the serpent and you know genesis chapter three you if in the day you shall eat thereof you shall be as gods knowing both good and evil it's interesting you know god has a sense of humor nothing escapes him uh you you actually also introduced me to an elon Musk video of him trying to uh explain modern quests for immortality using technology i was wondering for you know some viewers like myself who are not as you know equipped uh, in terms of the Joe Rogan world, what was some of that about, about Neuralink? Because I think that there's a connection here for a uh, quest for permanence that you see in Gilgamesh and in Genesis 3 what, with what Elon Musk is beginning to discuss. Yeah, well, you know, any attempt for me to summarize what he was getting at is, is going to be a completely botched take on it. But, you know, from my limited understanding uh, and take on everything that he was saying, you know, Neuralink, which is one of his companies, which he's, he's dedicating a good number of resources into, and um, which is also working incredibly quickly, is, is a company that is investigating um, how to merge human consciousness, uh, the human mind with what is it 
seeming to be the inevitable emergence of AI. And what it is, is it's, a, it's a basically a one inch in diameter um, implant that would be embedded with your brain and would be connected to um, your brain tissue through a series of thin wires. Um, and um, it would do, these wires would be able to emit an electrical signal and stimulate certain areas of the brain. And he said that the first wave of this would be to basically, um, uh, would be given to people who have brain injuries, um, people with epilepsy, um, people who may suffer from different levels of, um, uh, well, other brain injuries, you know, and, and um, I, I don't know specifically which ones, but theoretically he was saying that the power of this is pretty phenomenal. It, it's pretty, it's pretty impressive what he was claiming that these things could do. But later generations of this, he was saying, are, are going to be able to, um, it's very similar to the narrative of Alternated Carbon, which is a Netflix show, you would be able to actually upload and download basically like a memory bank, a brain state. You could save brain state similar to the way you could save your um, progress in a video game. Um, and, and that, in a sense, is, is starting to ask the question and try to, it's kind of blurring the line of what is human consciousness in relation to the body. And, um, and does the body end up becoming something more like what they call an alternated carbon, which is a sleeve, um, you know, something that is much more disposable than what we deal with now. And biblically, like that is, that is interesting because the Bible ends up talking and emphasizing about the, um, the important union between the body and the soul and and how the two are are um equally as important and and that is that is you know not always the case when you look at other um ideologies but uh it is interesting to, to see that right on the horizon here we are going to be asking ourselves these very very difficult questions questions that we might not even be able to really grasp until it you know it might be too late and that's that's a bit frightening um but it's but it had me thinking about these flood myths and making me wonder you know what technology did we have before you know these civilizations which we have very little to no record of except maybe these flood myths these stories that maybe even were told and passed down um verbally what technology did they possess and is there you know, is there anything that maybe we haven't discovered that can be discovered of these ancient civilizations or was it truly all wiped out by a cataclysmic flood? And, and that's something that I'm speaking about on the literal sense, on the historical sense, not necessarily on the mythical sense. And, and the reason why I point to that is because every single time that, you know, that uh, I, I love connecting the flood myths. And I think that there's something, there's something to be said about the fact that a collective human history keeps speaking about an event. It's something that even the ancestors of these people and these ancient, ancient civilizations keep on bringing up all over the world that this, this happened, this, this, this event happened and that, um, you know, it, it, it wiped out something. Um, yeah. I mean, just building on that, I think you brilliantly connect this idea that this is an event that did occur in our historical past. I think it's very hard to claim that this is purely allegory when you have, you know, geological, historical, and eyewitness testimonies. And not strictly only from, of course, the account of Torah, although we do hold, of course, the word of God to be authoritative in this. What we see here is you see multiple eyewitness accounts. And the idea of it, the quest for immortality, or a botched quest for immortality, rather, being at the root cause of why things go really wrong. Uh, you know, as we were discussing recently, a lot of my work at Fordham was in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And in Dead Sea Scrolls, a lot of people don't know, there's actually um, a scroll related to the lineage of giants, and Gilgamesh is listed among them, actually. Now, regardless of whether we treat this as uh, authoritative or not, what's very clear to me is that these narratives pertaining to Gilgamesh, this ancient king who wants to live forever after his friend has passed and travels to a garden where there's a fruit of immortality that is being guarded, well, I mean, for, for us as Christians, we know ultimately you have the great book ends of history, right? You have the book of Genesis that begins with the image of the historical garden mountain of Eden with the four rivers, the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And then of course you have at the end of time, Revelation chapter 22, you have a city descending out of heaven, the Edenizing as it were of that new heavens and that new earth. 
earth. And of course, you have the tree of life descending. Now, what's interesting is all world cultures, once again, do share this obsession with the tree. And we were discussing the other day about Yggdrasil, the Norse mythology. Obviously, I would say it's a very uh, fallen away, a uh, batched misunderstanding of what really was going on in Gen 3. But you can understand the branches of Asgard, the plane of heaven, uh, the trunk of Midgard, and the netherworld of, of hell to be something involved in quantum physics. I mean, there's really interesting data there. And I think so long as it's understood, you know, through through faith and reason, through the inerrancy of God's word, it's, re it's really amazing to see that Jesus' prophecy, I mean, a week before he's crucified, he's on the Mount of Olives. And Peter, James, John, and Andrew come in Matthew 24, and they ask, you know, what will the sign of your coming be? And Jesus makes a very strange prediction. He says, as in the days of Noah were, so too shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Now, if we believe as Christians that Jesus is God, he's the creator, he's referring to the time recorded in the book of Gilgamesh. He's referring to that antediluvian period. And now we're seeing people like Elon Musk, kind of like a modern day Gilgamesh, sort of following after Adam, you know, trying to confuse um, maybe with uh, a lot of uh, good intentions, uh, uh, trying to build a, a heaven on earth. And that's something we've seen in Brave New World and, you know, George Orwell. I didn't know if it reminded you of any fictional works that we had read or even some philosophy as we've discussed. I'm glad you mentioned the Christian ethic of the body, which is radically different, you know, from a, a pagan understanding of, of the flesh. So, yeah, this is definitely very strange times. And they look like they're fulfilling prophetic words. Yeah, well, I mentioned the fictional work of Alternated Carbon, and, I, and the reason why I mentioned that is because it's an interesting, it's an interesting adaptation of, of a possible future for, you know, us technologically, and, and, it, and it explores it politically, it explores like, it, you know, it's a very, it's a cool show, and in, in the fact that it, it builds upon what issues may arise on the socioeconomic and political level, um, when you start make, having these technologies widely available, um, and it, it, that's cool because I, I'm a big, I'm very interested in the idea of what technologies um, will yield certain um, consequences that are, are possible but difficult to predict until they are widely released and publicly available to, to all. And, and that's, um, that's something that's really interesting and, and difficult to think about with something like Neuralink. And, you know, I, you know, I'm very, I am very curious and interested to see what's going to happen. I think there's a lot of positives to it. Like I mentioned, the fact that the first wave of it is going to be directed towards people with brain injuries. I think that that's, I think that's amazing. And I, you know, I'm very curious to see what the debate and what the questions are, you know, going to be coming from, you know, um, like health regulators. Um, but, you know, if I were to think about like what other avenues of thought kind of arise from this it's you know it is you know I, I do go back to like that ancient perspective and that ancient thought and I think you know well what what waves of technology did we maybe um you know what there's this thing in the Fermi paradox let me back up a bit and it's this concept of you know the Fermi paradox is the is it's sort of uh you know it's sort of a stoner idea. It's the, it's the question of like, why haven't we seen aliens already? And I, I don't mean to take this, you know, all over the place, but the, but part no. of the Fermi paradox, no. yeah, part of the Fermi paradox is about the concept of that there are certain gates that, you know, civilizations or, or certain, you know, um, generations of life have to get through and have to survive past in order to make it to a certain level of civilization. And, you know, and, and, Basically, it implies that you know ultimate thriving as a uh, as a, some sort of intelligent being requires you know um, traveling outside of your your planet, you know the, your 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 source planet, for lack of a better word, um, your home planet. And so, um, you know, uh, the question is obviously all these smart people I'm sure are asking, you know, are we creating a piece of technology that? Um, is ultimately going to endanger us and will may, may end up being one of these gateways that we will not be able to pass through. You know, did Oppenheimer ask that when he created the atomic bomb, you know, did, were these questions um, asked? And, you know, that's something that's 
that definitely is a, a difficult conversation because, you know, as lay people, we, it's easy for us to sit here on our webcams and to say, oh, well, you know, they didn't really, that, you know, they knew this, they knew that. We don't really know what it was like to be inside their minds. Maybe, you know, it's, it's easier to explore it through a work of fiction and to just assume that um, science will progress no matter what. It's almost like this untamable beast in a lot of ways because, you know, if somebody refuses to make a piece of technology because they deem it too dangerous that it might destroy the whole world, somebody else is going to inevitably do it. And so it is, it is important to attach a, I don't know, a God-fearing will to such a creation that it is to, you know, to not, so. Oh yeah, because otherwise you end up Frankenstein's monster, basically. And, and I, I think, you know, that's where Mary Shelley may even be critiquing her late husband, Percy Fish Shelley, by yeah. saying, you know, hey, ultimately we can create after our own image, but humanity has fallen. I mean, we, when we enter this earth, we know that we are created in a state where we're still bound to the laws of entropy. That part of our genetic code that says thou shalt die. Yeah. Ultimately, you know, even if we were to reverse that technologically, all we would end up doing is producing a permanent fallen state. We wouldn't be producing um, an unfallen state because that's only, that is theologically speaking uh, something that can only come from above. Hence, yeah. Jesus in John 3, being born from above. And I think that's something which a lot of these great thinkers are referring to. They might have been very technologically savvy, but how philosophically in tune are they? The people who are developing CRISPR-Cas9, right? Those who are trying to genetically uh, manipulate um, the human person so that we're less susceptible to disease. My concern here, and I think you've hit the, the head on the nail, is ultimately, even if that were to be successful, I think of the alchemists of old. Um, the thing about an alchemist, let's say you were able to produce a philosopher's stone, you would end up with the medieval legend, and maybe there is some truth in these medieval legends about this wandering character who is forced to wander until judgment day. Sometimes he is of the nation of Israel, sometimes he's a member of the Gentile world, but he, although he's immortal, he's actually in constant suffering. I think Highlander back in the day tried to have this concept. And, and that's because ultimately, you know, we, to quote St. Paul in Romans 8, I think it's an 8, all of creation is groaning until the day of consummation. You know, we're, we're awaiting that fulfillment, that new heavens. So the thing is, right, what happens when you, you know, the real Frankensteins of the world are not people who are going to look like mad hatters. You know, they're going to look like, like someone very respectable, and very yeah. honorable. And I think to enter into a reasoned dialogue, like you're saying, with discernment is so necessary. You know, and, and just to go back on your previous question, what sort of line of fiction, is, you know, it, does this make me think of? I'm thinking of the concept of men in Tolkien's world, you yes. know, and in contrast, I guess you could say to elves, and there is some sort of blessing in men's mortality um, that Tolkien illustrates. It's the fact that they are, you know, destined to death that, that makes their lives so full, um, so precious. Um, and that's interesting. And, and so we're in a weird state right now where it seems like the time of men is ending. And I, I don't mean to sound alarmist. I think it's just interesting because we're starting to look at our future in an interesting way. We're starting to look at Mars as, and at other planets, and we're starting to think like, well, maybe we need to get off of the, this current rock as comfortable as it is. You know, there are plenty of alarmists out there, and, and, but, but there are plenty of people who are also just trying to figure out what permanent solutions are, and they're trying to take them into their own hands. And it's interesting how the human will tries to do that. They try to take so many of these very difficult problems and muster up solutions using, you know, what feels like this infinite power of technology. And um, it's, it's incredible to dream, but one, like I said, I'm really curious to see, and I want to continue to discuss this in future videos. What yeah. are these like limitations that we're going to discover? What could they be? As we start seeing a large, you know, a wide scale implementation of a lot of this technology, what are some limitations that might, you know, come upon us and what will be forced upon us because of 
some sort of level of desperation, like national security, who knows? And what will be, what will be encouraged as just a sign of, you know, human decency or, or because of human morality, you know? Will we find that there are two groups of people or more where do you see people who are opting in for this kind of procedure to have an implant? And then there's another group of people who decide not to, you know, or is everybody going to be plugged in? And what well, I think be that the Bible answer there right. is, you know, biblically, we know that there are two groups of people in the book of Revelation that are continually being referred to, those seated in the heavens and those who dwell on the earth. Well, it's interesting that the, um, the figure of dissidence in Revelation 13 is, we call him the Antichrist in scripture, right? But the thing is, that's not the name that John gives him in the Greek. The Greek word is therion, meaning beast. So the thing is, if you were to plug into that system, and this is all speculative, none of this is authoritative. You know, you and I are reasoning and building hypotheses, you know. But the thing is, I'm thinking if you were to yoke yourself to that kind of system and opt in, you are permanently yoking yourself to the earth. You are saying that this plane and the gates that you are opening of your own will, very much, you know, a my will be done mentality, is, is your eternal existence. And that seems to fit some of that biblical beast-like terminology, because then if you are neither, you know, human as defined by the human person as it now exists, a soul body composite, and you've manipulated the body, you've treated it like a shell, not a concrete part of your ontology or being, then all of a sudden you are basically taking a new mark of identity on you. Now, you know, however we want to think of the mark, what's unique is that mark of the therion, the beast, in the text is a a sign of identification. So rather than being yoked with the number of God, the number eight or seven of completion of fulfillment. Instead, it's the ultimate humanism, actually. Uh, the number six in the Bible always deals with humanity. Uh, the Temple of Solomon had, I think, six steps leading up to the throne room of the king. So the thing is, it's almost as though there is a war cry for a new humanism or transhumanism there that, I, you know, I, I think it is right to think of implications. But I think, as you and I both know, we, we are people of hope. Because we know that God, I, I believe that God is going to intervene in a dramatic way as at Babel in Genesis 11 um, before we reach a state like alternate carbon. But I think you're right. It's good to think of what are the moral ramifications in that hypothetical scenario? What might happen? And, you, you know, I think you're right to discuss opening gates. Think of the Palantir in The Lord of the Rings. Basically, Denethor and Saruman believe they have a new technology that allows them to see like Eru, like the creator of Middle Earth. They can see multiple places at once. Yet just because they see something like the black ships heading their way to uh, Gondor, doesn't mean that those black ships are manned by uh, servants of Sauron, the Dark Lord in that narrative. They're actually armed by Aragorn, the king. And it's interesting that Jesus says he's going to come like a thief in the night very much like Aragorn. So I, I often wonder, you know, in the middle of this technological advancement, as in the days of Noah, as in the days of Lot, as in the narrative of Sodom and Gomorrah in, in um, the Gospel of Luke, do you think that there is going to be a heightened awareness of some of the um, negative, you, we, people would call them supernatural, we would say preternatural portals that could be opened, just from your study of Tolkien, for example, or, or other works of literature. Yeah, like I said, it's, you know, we might be heightened and realize, well, we might gain a haptic sense of just the repercussions, the moral repercussions, and, you know, our sense of self, you know, our sense of being might change completely to an unfathomable point, and that's that's hard to talk about because it's something that we can't really visualize right now. And that's why I say, you know, are these going to be, you know, these might be situations and consequences that we will have to discover later once, once 
like I might have to have an implant in order to fully understand just how it affects me. And, and that's dangerous, you know? It's like, did Frodo have to put on the ring to actually understand the repercussions of it, you know? And, and that's difficult, but I won't get into that too far. But I, I, I do wanna talk about that there might be a trade-off, you know? There might be a trade-off from not getting an implant. And I don't mean to, to back up the, and justify, you know, um, embracing a technology, even if it, if it does cut you off from yourself. I'm not, you know, we don't necessarily know to what extent these will be um, medicinal, like, and, and in, a, in, a, in the full positive sense of the word, and how much they will actually um, distract us from ourselves in the ways that our smartphones on the worst of days do, you know, and uh, smartphones are basically, you know, um, very similar to what a neural link will do, except with extremely slow data transfer because we're just using our thumbs and I guess our voices to transfer information. It's just the data rate is slow. We're imagining with neural link, the data rate being incredibly high because, you know, um, just to paint a picture and not to completely reiterate what was um, the, the Joe Rogan podcast, but you won't be able, you won't even have to speak to one another if you two, you know, if two people have implants in, you would be able to much more efficiently you know, describe um, abstract ideas because you wouldn't be limited to the, you know, um, verbal vocabulary and to a certain words per minute that you're able to speak. So it's our way that we're going to be processing information is so different. And I, I fear that the divide between people who have it and don't have it is going to be so great. And that's what I'm a little bit worried about because when I think of stories of old and I think of, you know, ancient civilizations and the fact that we have no idea how they have built certain structures like Gobekli Tepe, you know, um, yeah. like, like certain civil, like, like certain structures, you know, we don't really know what technology they had. And I wonder if so far down the road, we'll look back at human civilization in the present, you know, from the future perspective and be like, wow, you know, these beings are almost unrecognizable in um you know in in the way that they have adapted technology the fact that they're using these fossil fuels you know like oh they're strapping themselves to these explosives and throwing themselves into space you know it's you know it's these aren't my own ideas i am i am adopting the devil's advocate perspective that others have of course have yeah voice, and but I, I think our viewers know that you know obviously you and i would definitely say if that technology was ever made well, we're not going to say that's the fulfillment of Revelation 13. It certainly would not be a good thing. That being said, yeah, you know, you're brilliant at adopting and, and articulating the, um, I, I think, the, the very transhumanist sorcerer's point of view. And I think you're right. You're absolutely, you know, clearly, if you take it to its logical conclusions, you end up in a world where man wants to become God, like Gilgamesh, like Lucifer like um, Adam in Gen Genesis 3 before his repentance. And so you're compelled to ask yourself, do you want to be a servant of the truth or do you want the truth to be your servant? And all I would argue is you cannot enslave the truth. The truth, of course, ontologically speaking, is the second person of the Trinity. He reveals himself to us as the way, the truth, and the life. This also basically applies whenever we use our rational faculty. The Lord Jesus Christ is with us, where, whether we are sleeping or waking in our thought processes. So to tamper with the human mind, to communicate, for example, without speech, like, you know, you and I sitting here, and there'd be no sound, you know, and we'd be communicating with our thoughts telepathically, or the body being able to transfer from place to place. These all are faculties, as, as we've discussed, you know, the Eldorado Diner and have Double Days. Shout outs to our favorite places. We hope they're still open after quarantine. I know. Um, you, you know, the thing about it is, like, th those skills existed according to St. Augustine and Irenaeus and all the church fathers um, by Adam and Eve before the fall, by the resurrection body, when Jesus literally walks through walls, enters into the upper room where the disciples are and says, peace be with you. And 
our body is when we're physically raised at the end of time, according to a biblical view of the world. So the thing is, maybe this is just me, but there always seems to be a pattern in scripture where God gives a promise of blessing, immortality, whatever it is, to a great hero, thinking of like Abraham. And usually, because they are impatient, they want to jump the gun. Um, God promises to Abraham that he's going to make his children more numerous than the stars. Abraham and his wife Sarah are really old. So instead of waiting for God's promise to happen, Abraham jumps the gun. He allows Sarah to, to uh, give him Hagar, her handmaid, as a second wife. And essentially through her, um, you know, sires Ishmael, who of course his descendants will inevitably war with Israel for generation upon generation. Meanwhile, God had always, from the beginning of time, promised to bless the world through Isaac. And of course, it's Isaac and Abraham who have the famous Akedah that foreshadows the crucifixion of Christ. In the same way, you know, I look at someone like uh, some of the church fathers. I think of Augustine, right? He was told about the narrative of God becoming man by his mother. But when he grew old, he rebelled against the religion of his mother, and he actually became a first uh, sort of a new ager of the time, a maniche, and then a, a rogue philosopher before he came back home. Because I think he was looking for the truth, but tried to find it in his pride first before he found it in humility. And so, you know, when I think of what you're beautifully illustrating here, about, you know, the devil's advocate position, right, of, of, of the transhumanist, I really think it's humanity's attempt to relive building a tower that reaches into the heavens. Might I suggest that the tower in Babel, yeah, okay, it might have been a literal tower, but God doesn't live on a giant puffy white cloud and throw down thunderbolts. We're talking interdimensional travel. So to your point, what technology did they have? Nimrod thought he was going to enter into the dimensionality of heaven and wage war with God. That's what he thought in Genesis 11, according to uh, some of the Midrashic traditions and the Dead Sea Scrolls. So clearly, that means either he was really stupid, that is Nimrod, and thought he was going to like pierce the, the ozone layer and, and find angels, or maybe he genuinely believed that he had an interdimensional technology, and maybe he did. And if I look at what CERN is doing, right? And if I look at what we're hearing out of Musk and this Gilgamesh tablet, you know, as our viewers know, our Lord Jesus Christ, whether you're a Christian or not a Christian listening to this, I would encourage you to see all the prophecies that his life fulfilled in 33 years, including, of course, the death of our sins on the cross. But as well, if, if those prophecies are, are fulfilled, how many more are still written in Scripture waiting for fulfillment? And this return to the days of Noah becomes an incredible theme. They were eating and drinking marrying and giving in marriage and on that day the flood came and took them at unawares in the same way uh we're told that it will be fire next time and you know i, I know graham hancock has his theories about that we're not saying that they're all true but he has an interesting hypothesis about the astrology of the ancient world and thinking of impacts from comets yeah i feel like there's so much we can play with here but I also think that we should reserve some of this for a part two yes. um, because I, gosh, I, I think that we need to end this on a note where we do talk about the fact that, you know, this will inevitably play out in mysterious ways that we cannot predict. And that is something that is, uh, that is incredibly hopeful. And I think that you're incredibly right. You know, if we, if we look biblically at this and we look at, at the promises that, you know, Jesus made and a lot of other um, you know, a lot of the things that he said, that there is, you know, there are absolutely going to be some severe consequences for any sort of incredible technology development. And we, you know, we're only as wise as we think we know. And um, as what we think we know, not to botch up what I'm saying. So I, I am curious to sort of see where this takes us as we find out more and more about it. And honestly, as we continue to discuss and kind of connect it to what we're reading, but, um, but John, do you have anything else to add? Yeah, so before we conclude, I just want to encourage people to uh, never take a single thing we say at face value for being true. 
but as is our maxim on book and spade to discern everything we're saying to test it by the authority and inerrancy of god's word to use your reason you know um, as christians we believe in the use of faith and reason and of course to hit us up with any questions you have for the youtube channel um, we hope that this stimulates you to do your own homework so you can come to the knowledge of the truth who we believe is not an idea but a person and we also pray that you will grow in relationship with that person so uh, honestly i'm really excited for part two of this exploration and i cannot wait to see what else we dig up. I, we were not planning on digging up Gilgamesh for this. It was sort of a happy accident as we were planning. So, and of course there are no accidents with God. One more note too, and I think you're right, reasons for hopefulness. You know, our Lord says very clearly in the gospel, um, actually in the whole of the Bible, 300 times or so, um, do not be afraid. And there is an overwhelming sense where if you are looking at this from a postmodernist point of view, if you're looking at this from um, even a, a pagan or pantheistic point of view, you know, you, you might wonder, you know, is this, to quote, you know, your, your beautiful rendition of Musk's point of view, is this inevitable? And the answer is no. God has given his promises in scripture. Those are, those blessings are inevitable. And of course, we know that he who set those down is faithful to bring those about. So every person who's listening to this is a beloved child, is a beloved heir to a kingdom. And we hope that you explore some of these sort of uh, edgy realities that not many people are really talking about through this medium, uh, just through the channel. So we thank you for your support, for your critiques as well, which we welcome. Uh, and we're very excited for our continuation of the voyage. Yeah, John, let's continue talking about this soon. All right. right on. All right. Take care.